everyone, and welcome to the Ford Presidential Library. Uh, winter has finally come, but that did not daunt your spirits, so we are delighted to have such a full house on our pretty much first cold and wintry night, so thank you for coming. My name is Elaine Didier, and it's my pleasure to serve as the director of the library and the museum. We're pleased to have you for this special public, first public program of our winter season. We had a, a hiatus over the holidays. We have a lot more good things coming, and I'll tell you about those after the close of this program, but we're glad you're here. Tonight's program is brought to you with the support of the National Archives and Records Administration, which is our parent organization in Washington, and with the support of the Gerald Ford Presidential Foundation. We're being taped by Michigan Productions tonight for future broadcast on Ann Arbor Cable, so we would ask that when you have questions during the conclusion of the program, you go to the microphone at the rear, at the center aisle, so that everyone who watches those broadcasts can hear your questions as well. And finally, a bit of housekeeping. Would you please make sure your cell phones are turned off at this time? To introduce our speaker tonight, I have invited my colleague, uh, David Horrocks, who is our supervisory archivist, to do the introductions. David. Thank you, Elaine, and a warm welcome on a cold night. Tonight we have the distinct uh, pleasure of hosting Candace Millard. Ms. Millard was once a writer and editor for National Geographic magazine. And that experience must have been handy in her research for her first book, the award-winning River of Doubt, Theodore Roosevelt's Darkest Journey. River of Doubt followed President Roosevelt on a poorly planned and deadly expedition down a tributary of the Amazon River. In researching the book, Ms. Millard trekked through the hinterlands of the Amazon, interviewed indigenous peoples, and experienced a terrifying plane engine cutout high over the rainforest. Legions of readers were rewarded for these efforts, and River of Doubt became a New York Times bestseller. It was named one of the best books of 2005 by, well, the New York Times, but also the Washington Post, the San Francisco Chronicle, the Christian Science Monitor, the Kansas City Star, and others. And tonight, Ms. Millard will be speaking about her second book, also her second New York Times bestseller, Destiny of the Republic, a tale of madness, medicine, and the murder of a president. It's a journey into 1880s America, told through the controversial election of President James Garfield, a surprisingly likable and interesting character. The shooting, the stalking and shooting of Garfield by a delusional political partisan, a man who once briefly lived here in Ann Arbor. And the horribly misguided medical efforts that stole Garfield's life rather than saved it. Christian Science Monitor said of this book, filled with memorable characters, hairpin twists of fate, and consequences that bring a young nation to the breaking point. Destiny of the Republic brings back to roaring life a tragic but irresistible time. Associated Press writes, the writing immerses readers into the period, making them feel as though they are living in that time. Comparisons to Eric Larson's Devil in the White City are justified, but Destiny of the Republic is better, says the Associated Press. I do too. I have a long list of other excerpts that I could read like that to you, but you don't want to listen to me. We all want to listen to Candace Millard. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? All right. Well, thank you so much for coming tonight, and thank you for inviting me here. Um, it's a real honor for me to be asked to speak at the Ford Presidential Library, so thank you for having me. At heart, this book is not about politics or science or even the shooting of a president. It's about an extraordinary drama that took place inside the White House over 80 days. 
In the 130 years since Garfield's death, the story has been largely forgotten. But even at the time, even though the entire nation, really the entire world, was watching, no one really understood what was happening. What began as a shooting became a bitter struggle over personal power and ambition. And the result was a brutal death of one of our most promising leaders at the hands of his own physicians. This is an intimate, heartbreaking story of ignorance versus science and greed versus heroism. James Garfield was not, as he has been remembered to be, just a bland, bearded 19th century politician. On the contrary, he was one of the most extraordinary men ever elected president. Although he was born into desperate poverty, he became a professor of literature, mathematics, and ancient languages by the time he was a sophomore in college. By the time he was 26, he was a university president. He was an incredible classicist. He knew the entire Aeneid by heart in Latin. While he was in Congress, he wrote an original proof of the Pythagorean theorem. To me, though, what is more incredible and more inspiring about Garfield, even than his brilliance, was his decency. You know, I wrote a, a book about Theodore Roosevelt, and I have great admiration for him. He was a firebrand, the hero, the center of every drama. That's not Garfield. Garfield was the calmest, wisest man in the room. He was a good, kind, honest man who was sincerely trying to do the right thing. He was a real person, not consumed by ego and ambition. Even after 17 years in Congress, in one of the most ruthless, vicious eras of machine politics, Garfield never changed. His friends used to marvel at his patience and forbearance, even in the face of the most brutal and personal attacks. But Garfield was incapable of holding a grudge. He would just shrug and say, I'm a poor hater. Although Garfield took his presidency very seriously, he had never had what he called presidential fever. In fact, he never ran for any office. He refused to campaign. And he always made it clear that he was going to follow his own conscience and convictions. And if people didn't agree with him, they shouldn't vote for him. When Garfield went to the Republican convention in the summer of 1880, not only was he not a candidate, he didn't even want to be one. He had gone there to give the nominating address for another man. The convention was in this enormous hall in Chicago. There were 15,000 people there. And the favorite to win, by far, was Ulysses S. Grant. And in the midst of the chaos and noise of thousands of people, Garfield got up to speak. And that speech was so powerful and so eloquent and extemporaneous that the hall slowly fell silent until all you could hear was Garfield's voice. Everyone was just riveted. They were spellbound. And at one point, Garfield said, and so, gentlemen, I ask you, what do we want? And someone in the crowd shouted, we want Garfield. <laughs> and the whole hall just went crazy. And when the balloting began, delegates began casting their ballots for Garfield. And again, he wasn't even a candidate. He stood up, and he objected. But the votes kept coming, and he couldn't stop what was happening. And what began as a trickle of votes became a stream, became a river, became a flood of votes, until finally Garfield found himself the Republican nominee 
for President of the United States. What I found again and again and again while researching this book was that not only was Garfield's life and his nomination and his brief presidency extraordinary, but the people who surrounded him were equally unbelievable. You just couldn't make them up. First, of course, there was Charles Guiteau, who was Garfield's would-be assassin. This was a deeply, dangerously delusional man, but he was very intelligent and highly articulate. If you read nearly any account of Garfield's assassination, Guiteau is referred to as a disgruntled office seeker, but that doesn't cover the smallest part of it. He was a uniquely American character, a product of this country at that time. It's a time when there was a lot of play in the joints and there was no one to really understand what he was up to and hold him to account for it. Guiteau was a self-made madman. He was smart and scrappy. He was a clever opportunist and he probably would have been very successful if he hadn't been insane. <laughs> Guiteau had tried everything and he had failed at everything. He had tried law, evangelism, even a free love commune and he had failed even there. <laughs> the, the women in the commune nicknamed him Charles Get Out. <laughs> but he survived on sheer audacity. He traveled all over the country by train never buying a ticket. He took great pride in moving from boarding house to boarding house and slipping out when the rent was due. And even when he occasionally worked as a bill collector, he just kept whatever he managed to collect. <laughs> After the Republican convention, Guiteau became obsessed <coughs> with Garfield. And immediately after the election, he began stalking him. He went to the White House nearly every day at one point, he even walked into the president's office while Garfield was in it. He sat on a bench outside of the White House day after day, hour after hour, just waiting for Garfield to come out. He even attended a reception where he met the first lady. He shook her hand, he gave her his business card, and he carefully pronounced his name so she wouldn't forget it. Was like Hitchcock movie. It was incredibly creepy and absolutely terrifying. Finally, Guiteau had what he believed was a divine inspiration. God wanted him to kill the president. It was nothing personal, he would later say, simply God's will. As strange and fascinating and nearly as dangerous as Guiteau was Roscoe Conkling. Conkling was a vain, preening, brutally powerful machine politician who had appointed himself Garfield's enemy. He used to wear canary yellow waistcoats and he wrote in lavender ink and he had this great spit curl as you can see in the middle of his forehead and he recoiled at the slightest touch. In fact, his vanity was so outsized that another member of Congress Ridiculed, for it, ridiculed him for it famously on the floor of Congress. But Conkling was no joke. He was dangerously powerful. As a senior senator from New York, he controlled the New York Customs House, which was then the largest federal office in the United States and controlled 70% of the entire U.S. Customs revenue. Conkling tightly controlled patronage within his state, and he expected complete and unquestioning loyalty. In fact, his apartment in New York was known as the morgue. Conkling was enraged when his candidate, former President Grant, didn't win the nomination, but he was apoplectic when he realized that he couldn't control Garfield. To Conkling, the attempt on Garfield's life was his ticket back into power. But for the first time in Conkling's life, Nothing turned out as he had planned. Next is Chester Arthur. 
Chester Arthur was Garfield's vice president, but he was Conkling's man. Politically, he was completely Conkling's creation. In fact, the only other political office he had held before the vice presidency was as the controller of the New York Customs House, a job that Conkling, through Grant, had given to him. In that position, he made as much money as the president, and he never showed up for work before noon. Arthur preferred a life of leisure. He liked fine clothes, old wine, late dinner parties, and he was nearly as preening as Conkling. In fact, he even moved his birthday back a year to appear more youthful. Even within the Republican Party, Arthur's nomination to the vice presidency was considered a ridiculous burlesque. After the election, Arthur continued to make it clear where his loyalties lay. He took vacations with Conkling, he even lived with Conkling in Washington, and he took every opportunity to publicly criticize the president. And then, suddenly, everything changed. After Garfield was shot, Arthur made a transformation so stunning and complete that no one could believe it. The entire country was horrified at the thought that Chester Arthur might be president. But unlike Conkling, Arthur was sickened and grief-stricken by the shooting. The last thing he wanted was for Garfield to die. He hid himself from public view. He refused even to go to Washington for fear that it would look like he was waiting in the wings, and he cut himself off from Conkling. Finally, after turning his back on the man who had made him, Arthur found moral strength in the most unlikely of places, the letters of a young invalid woman named Julia Sand. Sand believed in Arthur when no one else did, when he didn't even believe in himself. After the shooting, Sand wrote to Arthur, if there is a spark of true nobility in you, now is the moment to let it shine. Faith in your better nature forces me to write to you, but not to beg you to resign. Do what is more difficult and more brave, reform. And to everyone's amazement, not least of all his own, Arthur did. He changed dramatically, and he tried to be the president that Garfield would have been had he lived. He became not a great leader, but an honest and respected one, and he never forgot Julia Sand. Not only did he keep her letters and write back to her, but as president, he went to see her. One day after Sunday dinner, Sand was in her brother's house when a highly polished carriage pulled up out front and outstepped the President of the United States, who had come to thank her in person. The reason Arthur became president was not Guiteau's madness or Conkling's political maneuverings, but the ambition, ignorance, and dangerous arrogance of the man who assumed control of Garfield's medical care, Dr. Dr. Willard Bliss. That's right, his first name was Doctor. His parents <laughs> had named him Doctor. Bliss was a well-known surgeon with a profitable practice. In fact, he had been one of the doctors at Abraham Lincoln's deathbed. But he had far from a sterling reputation. He had enthusiastically sold something called Kundurongo, which was supposed to cure cancer, syphilis, ulcers, chronic blood diseases, you name it. Bliss had been disgraced for taking bribes, and he had even spent a brief time in prison. When Lincoln's son, Robert Todd Lincoln, Garfield's Secretary of War, sent for Bliss after the shooting, Bliss saw in this national tragedy a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for fame and power. He immediately took charge of the president's medical care, even though no one had given him the authority, he just took it. He dismissed the other doctors, and he completely isolated Garfield in a sick room in the White House. He wouldn't even let him see his Secretary of State. And what happened in that room 
inside the White House is nothing short of horrifying. Bliss and the few surgeons he had handpicked to help him inserted unsterilized fingers and instruments in Garfield's back again and again, day after day, searching for Guiteau's bullet. The last thing Bliss wanted was for Garfield to die. He had too much at stake, but he was slowly and excruciatingly killing the president. The only hope for Garfield was to find the bullet and end the search, but this was 14 years before the invention of the medical x-ray. What, what happened next is nothing short of incredible. Only the most brazen novelist would make it up. None other than Alexander Graham Bell stepped forward to help. Bell, a young, restless genius, had invented the telephone just five years earlier when he was only 29. By 1881, the telephone had <coughs> made him a little money and a lot of fame, but he wanted nothing to do with the company that had grown up around it. He said it was hateful to him at all times and that it fettered him as an inventor. Worse even than the business itself were the lawsuits that surrounded it. There were 600 lawsuits against the Bell Telephone, five of which went to the United States Supreme Court. Finally, Bell had enough. He said he was sick of the telephone and he quit the company. Bell just wanted to help people. He had lost both of his brothers to tuberculosis before he was 24 years old. Both his mother and his wife were deaf and he knew that he could make life better for people, maybe even save lives. But he worked so hard that his wife and his parents were terrified that he would literally work himself to death. When he was working, he would not stop to rest or eat. His only respite was to play the piano deep into the night. But even then, he played with such an intensity that his mother, who had taught him to play, called it a musical fever. When Garfield was shot, Bell turned his life upside down to try to help him. It sickened him to think of Garfield's doctors blindly searching for the bullet. Science, he said, should be able to do better than that. Bell abandoned everything he was doing and spent day and night inventing something called an induction balance, which was basically a metal detector that he connected to a telephone receiver in which he slowly ran over the president's body, listening for a telltale buzzing that would tell him where the bullet was lodged. In the end, Bell and science were defeated, but not because the invention didn't work. It did work. In fact, it went on to save countless lives before the invention of the medical x-ray. Alexander Graham Bell was defeated by the president's own doctors. As I began my research for this book, the question that kept coming to me was, how could this have happened? What I found, first of all, was that the presidency in 1881 was very different from the presidency today. First of all, the Secret Service. Even though this was 16 years after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, there was still no Secret Service protection for the president. In fact, Garfield had no protection at all beyond his 23-year-old private secretary and an aging police officer. Not only was the president not protected from the public, he was expected to interact with them on a daily basis, face to face, one on one. You have to remember that this was the height of the spoil system and many Americans believed that they were entitled to government jobs, even if they had no training or experience for them. But more than that, they insisted on making their case to the president himself. Garfield was forced to meet with office seekers every day from 10.30 a.m. until 1.30 p.m. The situation made Garfield desperate. He longed for time to want to work and think, and he wondered why anyone would ever want to become president. But while he found office seekers tiresome, even maddening, he never believed that they were dangerous. He said that assassination can no more be guarded against than death by lightning, 
and it's best not to worry about either. He rode his horse and walked all along, all through the streets of Washington, completely by himself. In fact, one night he left the White House. He walked down the street to the Secretary of State's house, and the two men walked alone together through the streets of Washington, with Guiteau following them the entire way, holding a loaded gun. In fact, by that time, Guiteau had been stalking the president for weeks. He had even followed him to church, where he had considered shooting him. Finally, he made his decision. The president he knew would be at the Baltimore and Potomac train station in Washington, D.C. on the morning of July 2nd, 1881, and Guiteau would be waiting. The moment Garfield walked into the station, Guiteau stepped out of the shadows and shot him twice. The first bullet hit the president in the arm, and a second ripped through his back. By an incredible stroke of luck, however, Guiteau's bullet did not kill the president. The bullet that tore through his back didn't hit his spinal cord, it didn't hit any vital organs. Today, he would have spent a few nights in the hospital. Even if he had just been left alone, he almost certainly would have survived. Unfortunately for Garfield and the nation, Dr. Bliss stepped in. Bliss took advantage of the fear and the chaos following the shooting to assume control of Garfield's medical care. But he was not only ambitious and arrogant, he adhered to the most traditional medical methods of the time. Bliss gave Garfield, a gunshot victim, rich foods and alcohol. He took great pride in what he called the healthy pus issuing from the president's wound, and he avoided any treatment that he considered to be new and radical, including antisepsis. The renowned British surgeon Joseph Lister had discovered antisepsis 16 years earlier, and the death rate in his own surgical ward had immediately plummeted. He had traveled all around begging doctors to sterilize their hands and instruments, and warning them that if they didn't, they ran the very real risk of killing their patients. By 1881, antisepsis was widely adopted throughout Europe. The most experienced and respected doctors in the United States, however, still considered it useless, even dangerous. Some still didn't even really believe in germs, and they certainly didn't want to go to all the trouble that antisepsis required to kill them. They took great pride in what they called the good old surgical stink. They wouldn't change or wash their surgical aprons because they believed the more blood and pus encrusted on them, the more experience it showed. Even those who tried antisepsis had very little luck uh, for reasons that today seem painfully apparent. They would sterilize their knives, but if they dropped them during surgery, they would just pick them up and continue to use them. If they needed both of their hands during surgery, they would hold the knife in their teeth and then continue to use it. Even Alexander Graham Bell couldn't outrace infection that was coursing through Garfield's body. The story, however, does not end there. Garfield's death brought about tremendous changes, changes in medicine, in politics, in the very fabric of our nation. As soon as Garfield's autopsy was released, Americans understood that their president didn't have to die, and they understood why he did. Bliss was publicly disgraced, and antisepsis was immediately adopted throughout the country. Americans turned their rage and their grief on the political system that had encouraged a madman like Guiteau. Chester Arthur himself, who owed his entire career to patronage, signed the Pendleton Act, which was the beginning of the end of the spoil system. Garfield's death also brought the country together in a way that had not been seen since the Civil War. Lincoln's assassination had only deepened that divide, but Garfield had been the first president since the Civil War to be accepted and trusted by the entire country, north and south, immigrant and pioneer, freed slave and former slave owner. His death was their loss, and their common grief brought them together. 
Above all, Garfield's death changed the presidency itself. You could argue that this really marked the end of the idealistic or perhaps naive concept of the president alone meeting with office seekers one-on-one, -on -one, making appointments at every level of government. It was obviously an unworkable system for a lot of reasons. It was open to corruption, it was completely inefficient, and it was personally dangerous. And it would never have worked as the United States grew into a major world power. And it's good that it's gone. But at the same time, these changes make it almost impossible to ever again elect someone like Garfield. The presidency today is not about a single person, but about a large, complex institution. The presidency is too big and too distant for Americans to be able to choose someone who isn't even trying to be elected. We have hopefully outgrown the day when a madman could just walk into the Oval Office and an incompetent doctor could seize control of the White House for nearly three months, killing the president in the process. But we likely have also outgrown the day when Americans could recognize the promise of a fine, honest man, a man with no financial support, no political machine, just the strength of his own words and ideas, and in a shining moment of democracy, make him our leader. Thank you. Thank you. I'd be happy to take questions if, if there are any. I think uh, the microphone's there. Hi, thank you very much for your book. I, I work in healthcare, and it, after reading your book, it really indicates the first do no harm that we live by. It's unbelievable. First, don't torture your president. Uh, two things I wanted to ask you real quick. Um, I've read about Garfield and collected some books from, from the 1800s about him. Uh, one thing that kind of disappointed me was that Blaine went to Conkling when he was trying to get the party's nomination. wanted to know your thoughts on that. and. Um, I know you've met some of Garfield's family, and uh, how were they? And, and that must have been very exciting. Okay, yeah. So, um, so Blaine, so um, any of you have uh, had a chance to read the book? Um, uh, when Blaine and Garfield had been friends, um, and Garfield respected Blaine, um, but he didn't completely trust him. Blaine had sort of um, uh, turned the tables on Garfield a couple of times in their long careers in Congress together, um, and so he said, "Look." I'd like for you to be my Secretary of State with one condition. I don't want you to ever again run for president because I don't want anyone, including myself, to use these four years as a platform uh, to run again. And Blaine agreed to that. And uh, uh, Garfield died, and Blaine tried again to run for president. Um, so I think he really cared about Garfield and, and loved him, but he uh, you know, as um, many men in politics and women, really hungered for the presidency. He really, really wanted it. And so he was willing to do anything, including asking Conkling, his long-term enemy, um, to support him. And Conkling, you know, just laughed at it. You know, so it, um, you know, it sort of s speaks to Blaine's character. There were a lot of good things about him, this one questionable thing. Um, Garfield's family, I did have the pleasure of meeting with many of them, and they're terrific. You know, they, um, 130 years later, they really, you could see in them, you know, this forebear. You know, they were, they were kind, they were absolutely gracious, they were warm and welcoming. You know, I, what's lost uh, about Garfield is not just his presidency, but who he was. And the American people knew that at the time, and they, and they grieved the fact that you know, history would forget his presidency. But more than that, they, they were sorrowed by the idea that no one would know what this man was like. You know, this is a man who would give you a bear hug rather than a handshake. And he had this big, booming, infectious laugh and was telling jokes. And he loved his friends. And he loved life. And um, you know, a life that was taken from him when he, from him when he was 49 years old. Um, but you see this, uh, you know, his wife, he and his wife were very much in love, and they, 
raise these wonderful children who in turn raised wonderful children. So that's, that's definitely been a legacy that's been carried on. Thank you. One quick comment and then a question. Um, somewhat by accident, I visited the Garfield tomb in Cleveland. Uh, and I don't know if you mentioned it in the book, but it's uh, for someone who's, who effectively served only for four months as president, he gets one hell of a tomb, he I does. must say. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it's it's a, impressive. It's a walk-in mausoleum. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I'm curious about how different you think. You talked about some changes, medical and, and uh, administrative. Uh, did Arthur turn out to be such a different president, uh, despite, of course, his unpromising beginnings, than Garfield? What do you think the, the nation lost because Arthur was president for those three and a half years and Garfield was not? Uh, that's a great question. I think, um, you know, I think Arthur did change dramatically, but he um, never was and was never going to be the, the man Garfield was. Um, what, one of the things that made um, Garfield so powerful and, his, and, and the possibilities of his presidency so great was that he hadn't wanted to be president. You know, he hadn't fought for years for, for this possibility. He hadn't promised, made promises. He, had, he, he was himself. He knew himself. He had a strong character. He, he sort of had strong ideals. And he wasn't beholden to anyone. And, and you know, Arthur, although he had cut himself off, did, really didn't have that. It was, it's very rare to have that. And he just didn't finally have the character that Garfield had. Also, I think, you know, Garfield, um, he was, had been, always been a fierce abolitionist. He, he hid a runaway slave at one point. He, he was instrumental in bringing about black suffrage. I mean, he, the speech he gives on the floor of Congress in support of black <coughs> suffrage would break your heart. It's unbelievably beautiful. So I think that he would have made, uh, you know, more advances in rights for freed slaves. Um, and education. Education was obviously... Garfield's savior, and it was, it was vitally important to him. And in fact, while he was in Congress, he helped to establish the first Department of Education, which is very different uh, from what we have today. It was smaller, and, but that was always something that was important to him, and I think we would have seen more advances in that as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for a fine, fine book. Uh, you. You've mentioned some of President Garfield's uh, scholarly background and, and expertise. And I, I, uh, you had made brief mention in the book, I believe, about his being a pastor as well. I wondered if your research led you to any uh, information about his Michigan connection. I understand that he was a pastor uh, here. I don't. I don't know if, it, any, I'm, if anybody does. I'd love to hear, but I, I'm sorry, I don't. Any other questions? Just some, one thing what, uh, I was wondering about, and it was through your research, uh, um, but did um, Alexander Graham Bell and President Garfield had a prior relationship before he tried to save them? They did not, and um, that's one of the things that fascinated me. In fact, I, I didn't come at this book through President Garfield. Like most Americans, unfortunately, I knew almost nothing about, about Garfield beyond the fact that he had been assassinated. Um, uh, my first book had had a lot of science in it, and I wanted another subject that was science heavy, and I was researching Alexander Graham Bell. And I stumbled upon this story of him inventing this induction balance to try to help Garfield, and it really surprised me. You know, again, he's 34 years old. He had invented the telephone just five years earlier. He could do anything he wanted, and he absolutely turned his life upside down. He worked on nothing else for almost three months to try, try to help Garfield. And, and I thought, why? why? Why would he do this? And that's when I started researching Garfield and was astonished by this um, remarkable man. Yes. Oh, well, like martyrdom to bring everybody together. <laughs> uh, you, you do quote from a letter from a young woman in the South uh, after his death. In, in a sense, though, this, this was a period of, a very, of weak presidencies. And Perhaps it's a little naive to think that had Garfield lived, uh, first of all, this is a man from the North, he was a Union general, a strict abolitionist as, as he became. There were no Union troops quartered in the South anymore. And I, 
I, I think it's highly unlikely in, in the respect that you, uh, to which you refer. And he could have made much of a difference as far as the situation with uh, blacks, African Americans in the South in uh, the period after Hayes' presidency until almost the present day. It's, it's impossible to know. Um, I, it's remarkable, though, if you read the, the newspaper articles of the time, the journal articles of the time, the outpouring of grief, and not just grief, but rage over this assassination. And, and it absolutely was from the South as much as the North. As I said, you know, Lincoln's death really deepened that divide, and the South didn't feel that they could mourn they felt implicit in his death. Um, and that wasn't the case uh, for, for Garfield. And, and there was this, this respect for him and this, and this trust for him. You know, he, he said, I, we don't want revenge here. We want um, an understanding that all men were created equal and everyone is entitled to the same rights. I mean, Absolutely, I agree that it would be naive to believe that there would be these sudden changes um, in, in this sort of deeply held racism. Um, but you have to marvel at the fact that they are able to accept him at all, um, given his background. Um, and they did. And it, and it you know, the, the coming together of the nation obviously wasn't perfect, and there were still a lot of problems after his death. But, um, but it was profound at that time. Hi. Candace, could you tell us a little bit uh, about Guiteau's time here in Ann Arbor? I think it would be interesting. <laughs> it was brief. Um, so he thought he would go to school. You know, he, uh, Guiteau was um, basically raised by his father and his oldest sister. His mother died when he was very young. And, um, and he had a, 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 zealous, a zealous father, and, and he was troubled. You know, he was sort of searching and, and really, I think, suffered from mental illness um, very early on. In fact, his, his family had tried to have him institutionalized um, several times, but he lived this um, very peripatetic, very solitary life, and he would just um, slip away again and again and again, and so he, and that's how he sort of found himself at this, this free love commune. You know, he was just searching for something, and then he focused in on, on Garfield after this really remarkable turn of events at the convention. So he was a, he, he was a very strange, tragic, um, but fascinating man. Um, and as I say, the, the country was enraged after Garfield's death and determined to see Guto hanged, and, and he was hanged this time. It's no, a real sorry. opportunity to have you here. Could you talk a little bit about the dynamic of um, Dr. Bliss? Uh, in reading your book, I understood that there were people from around the country writing letters to Lucretia saying, wait, he's doing this wrong. What I didn't understand is how did those people know um, you know, she was getting letters from, what, Kansas, was it, or whatever? And <laughs> yet there was a team of physicians, yet Bliss was masterful, it seemed, in keeping them away from good care, and yet people really recognized that. And not only did he get away with it there, but then also, even after the autopsy was released, I mean, he did get away with it, even coming to Congress for $25,000 at a later point. That, it amazes me the power he wielded. If you could talk about how he, how did he own that and make it happen when it seemed apparent what he was doing. So, well, it, you know, it was, you have to understand, this was a very different time. And again, this, this presidential assassination came as a huge shock to the nation. I mean, as it would at any time, but especially then. You know, Lincoln's assassination was considered a result of war. And there are a lot of assassinations going on in Europe, but, but the Americans thought, well, that's because those are monarchies, and those people are, these, these leaders are forced on them. Here in America, we get to freely choose our leaders, so there shouldn't be any danger to them. So when Garfield was shot, Bliss took advantage of this 
incredible chaos and fear and confusion, confusion surrounding the, um, the assassination. And so, you know, there were nine different doctors at the train station, all of whom inserted unsterilized fingers and instruments in Garfield's back. The first examination took place on the floor of the train station, if you can imagine a more germ-infested environment. And all of those doctors went with Garfield back to the White House. And Bliss, incredibly confident, you know, Lincoln's son had called him. He had been at Lincoln's deathbed. He sits down and quickly dictates a letter to the other doctors saying, the president and I thank you for all of your efforts, but it will be no, no longer be necessary. And what happened was that then he took control and Garfield starts to get better and then he takes this sudden turn and, and gets sicker and sicker and sicker. Bliss, meanwhile, is issuing these medical bulletins saying, you know, this is what's going on and don't worry, the, you know, the president's doing fine, but people after a while weren't buying it and people started to ask questions. So finally someone said, how did Bliss come to have control of the president's medical care? And Bliss said, well, I had a private conversation with the president and the first lady and they asked me to assume control. And Lucretia later came out and said that conversation never took place. But I, again, it was just confusion and fear and Lucretia, in fact, asked her own personal physician to stay, who was a woman, which was very rare at that time, Dr. Edson. In fact, it was so rare that the newspapers referred to her as Mrs. Dr. Edson, because they didn't know what to do with a female doctor. <laughs> but she stayed. Um, but there was this understanding of Listerian method, mostly by young doctors. And there were young doctors who were watching in horror, but felt like they couldn't say anything to contradict these older, much more respected, much more experienced doctors. And the, the doctor you're referring to in Kansas had also studied the Listerian method, and he wrote to Garfield saying, don't let them probe the wound, make sure they sterilize everything. But those kinds of doctors weren't heard. So um, was Guiteau actually looking for a position in the government, or did he just get mislabeled as an office seeker? He was, he, he was absolutely. He, um, so after Garfield, again, is nominated in this incredible turn of events. Guiteau thinks, okay, this is great. This is the height of the spoil system. He absolutely believed in the spoil system. And he thought, it's first come, first serve. And, you know, I think I'd like to be ambassador to France. And so he starts, literally, he starts writing to the president. And that's when he starts going to, the, well, first of all, he goes to New York and he goes to the campaign office every day, every day, every day. And then when Garfield is elected, he says, well, I, you know, I clearly single-handedly made Garfield president, so out of gratitude, you know, he will give me this ambassadorship. So he starts going to the White House every day, the State Department every day, um, asking for this, and becomes more and more frustrated, more delusional, more desperate. You know, he has no money. He's moving from boarding house to boarding house. He's not eating. He's, he has, you know, these thin clothes, and, um, and, and finally has, again, what he thinks is a, a divine inspiration. So, Yes, he was looking for an appointment, but he was insane. About 18 years ago, I was at the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology at Walter Reed. And there was Garfield's spine with uh, the bullet hole traced uh, using, I wondered if this nefarious physician, Bliss, had anything to do with that last insult. Yes, they, um, they removed that during the autopsy. It's about a six inch section of Garfield's spine with a, a red pin um, in it. And um, I, know I saw it as well, it's still there. And um, they used it during the trial, as an exhibit during the trial. And they kept it, and what's interesting, um, I was just talking about this at dinner. Um, I, so I first went to um, Walter Reed, it's the National Museum of Health and Medicine, um, when I began my research about three years ago. and. Um, I knew that they had this, and so they said, yes, here it is, and it's strange and heartbreaking to hold this. And they said, we, you know, we also have, and they opened a drawer, and they're like, here's Guiteau, and they're just like, you know, here's a femur, here's a hand, and there's John Wilkes Booth, 
in the same drawer. <laughs> and this is crazy. But they also have, of Guiteau, they have a jar about this big with chunks of his brain. After he was hanged, he um, was exhumed, his body was exhumed, and taken to the museum, and they did an autopsy and to see if there were any physical signs of insanity, especially they were interested in his brain. So they cut it up, and they sent it around the country to experts who couldn't find anything, and sent it back, and uh, so it's still in this jar. <laughs> so, <laughs> very odd. Although I live up here, I'm from Ohio originally, I'm from Cincinnati. Hmm. We have a beautiful uh, little place where there are government buildings um, downtown called Garfield Place. Mm -hmm. The question I really wanted to ask was, <coughs> I know from looking at this, uh, um, you know, I was kind of interested in statistics and um, Garfield, although they say he was elected as a, as a, from the House of Representatives, wasn't he also elected by the Ohio House of Representatives to be an Ohio, an Ohio senator, a senator from Ohio, a U.S. senator from Ohio, and, and he had to resign from that to become president? Can you talk about that a little bit? I don't that's know right. That's, that's exactly right. right. So he had served 17, almost 18 years in Congress, and um, just before the uh, convention in 1880, he was elected to the U.S. Senate. And, um, and then <laughs> when he finds himself the nominee for president, he, he, ca he never is able to take his Senate seat, seat and so being president instead. That's exactly right. Well, thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry, did you? <laughs> I'll take one more, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, but I'm back. I, I was thinking, I remember from many years ago reading about Guteau saying that he was a stalwart among stalwarts, and that that being a political position mm -hmm. within the Republican Party, and that he felt that's why he was being overlooked. It was really a political discrimination against him. Can you explain what that term might have meant mm -hmm. in the context of the day and, and how it played out in his own fevered mind? Yes, I'd be happy to. So, right, when after um, Guiteau shoots Garfield in this crowded train station, he's very quickly captured, and he shouts out, I am a stalwart among stalwarts, and, and Arthur will be president. Okay, at that time, um, the Republican Party was deeply divided, split into two factions. There was the stalwart faction, which was very conservative and wanted to protect the spoil system. And this is Conkling, and this is also, also obviously Arthur. And then there were what they called the half-breeds, um, and were um, much more liberal and, um, and, uh, and wanted reform, and that is Garfield. And so after Garfield is you know, thrust into this position, he is also forced upon him is Chester Arthur to sort of placate Conkling because they needed New York votes and they needed Conkling to help them. And so, um, and so Guteau, as he becomes more and more frustrated that he's not getting this appointment that he believes he deserves, he thinks, okay, you know, God wants me to kill Garfield because he wants a stalwart, Chester Arthur, to be president. And that's the story behind that. All right, well, thank you again very much. Thank you so much. We have a, a gift to help Candace uh, sign copies of her books for you. We have a pen set with oh, the signatures of wow. Gerald Ford. Oh, so good. sign and uh, use Wonderful. it in good health. That's thank you so beautiful. much for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's gorgeous. So she's cut out. Okay. A couple of more things about Candace. I want you to know that she has also spoken at the Carter Library, which gave us rave reviews, and my counterpart there referred to her as the next David McCullough. So <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> we have a star. And you'll also be interested to know that over dinner, which was a fascinating conversation, her next book is on none other than Winston Churchill and his adventures in South Africa. So stand by in about two or three years. Four. <laughs> we were talking about the, the Churchill archives, so who knows where, where that will lead her. Uh, let me give you a highlights of some upcoming programs because all of a sudden things have fallen into place and uh, we're really, really excited. In February, we will be hosting Shane Harris, who is the winner of the Ford Journalism Award for coverage of national defense. 
Uh, he'll be talking about the new Cold War, hackers, drones, and cyber spies. In March, on the 28th, we will have journalist Marvin Kalb. We are so excited. He and his wife have just authored a book called Haunting Legacy, Vietnam and the American Presidency from Ford to Obama. And he will be talking about Vietnam's long shadow and impact on our country. So that will be fascinating. And then uh, we have just booked uh, Frank Zarb, who was uh, an energy czar during the Ford administration. He spoke uh, last year in, uh, in Grand Rapids at the museum. He's being sponsored by Varnum Law, and he's going to be talking about our most important policy failure, energy. So three really strong programs coming up to, to follow a strong opening. So we, uh, we have information about all the programs. We have information about joining Friends of Ford, which is the Ford Foundation group that makes all of this programming possible. And uh, you can also sign up to receive email notices about our programs. And we have a reception and a chance for you to talk to Candace Millard. And if you wish, pick up a copy of her book. So Candace, will, Kate will escort you out before the crowd. Thank you all for coming, and we'll see you again.